Satan doesn't run hell. God does. So what did you say? I said Satan doesn't run hell. God does. I'm going to show you from the scriptures today that that is in fact the reality. Now I'm sure a lot of people have seen these pictures and things of the devil. He's sitting down there and he's on this throne and there's flames everywhere around him. I'll show you an example of one. Okay. Right there you go. Down in hell and there's the devil on his throne and the the, the demons all come before him, their master, Satan, and stuff like this. Um, that's not the right thing. That's not true, according to the King James Bible. And I'm just going to give a little warning about something. Um, a ministry I've stood for for a long time, Chick Publications. Um, I'm not coming out against Chick Publications. They put out a lot of good information. But uh, I've been getting some things from some of the brethren, and they're going, Brother Brian... Chick Publications puts out some things that are just plainly not in Scripture. And there's just no real desire to change there. And uh, David Daniels, I think I think the world of the man, and I, th I think a lot of people that are involved there, I don't know a lot of people, but there are certain things that the Bible does not teach. You say, well, artistic creativity, we're just trying to show people and things and get people to think certain ways. Uh, brethren, I believe that this book is written in such a way that the more you quote it as it is and not try to mess with it, the more spiritual power that you will have. And I think that Chick Publications, if they would actually stick with what the Bible teaches and not use artistic interpretation, drawing men with wings and calling them angels, there's no scripture for that, brethren. There's none. Putting Satan on a throne and sticking him in hell there's no scripture for that. I'm going to prove that in this study today. And I think if we would stick by the word of God and say, you know what? I don't want tracts. I don't want gospel tracts that don't have scriptures word for word from the King James Bible. I don't want that stuff. I need to have scripture. I want the power of God's word. It's fine to make some, some written things and stuff like that. I mean, you're dealing with lost people. They can't understand God's word the way a Christian can. So it's okay to put little writing and stuff in there and stuff, but man, you, you got to have, you got to stick with the book, brethren. And, you know, uh, like I said, I'm not, I'm not going to attack chick publications and say they're wicked and uh, apostate and whatever else and things, but I'm not going to be handing out most of the tracks simply because, um, and I've had a lot of brethren write me and say this, should we really be handing out these tracks? I'll just show you here. This is these are the comic books. Probably has the back same thing in it. You know, yeah. Should we be handing out these tracks when they have winged angels? There are no such thing. There's cherub, cherubim, seraphim. Cherubim have four wings. Seraphim have six wings. You know, there's no such thing as angels, men having wings in the Bible. There's not one. Uh, the book of Hebrews talks about some have entertained angels unawares. Well, how can you do that if the guy's got wings? Okay, uh, that's ridiculous. They also came out with a tract years ago where Jesus Christ was a black man, uh, so as not to offend the black people. Uh, well, I'm a German, okay? Should I have a tract where Jesus is a German? No, my Savior's a Jew, all right? I'm not going to come out and say, well, I find that offensive, that I have to believe in a Jewish you know, Savior. You know, no, he's a Jew. And if you're black out there, you're... Savior is a Jew. And if you're Oriental or white or whatever other thing, you, whatever race you are, kindred you are, your Savior is a Jew. Don't change his identity. Right? And don't come out with tracts that have Satan sitting in hell on a throne. That's a lie. That's not true. It's not what the Bible teaches. And we're going to be going through that today. But another thing that they have in the back, and, I, and again, I'm going to say this. I'm just, this, this ministry, I'm going to tell the truth. Um, even if it hurts. Just as simple as that. You have here in the back, the Bible says there's only one way to heaven. This is in the back of all the chick tracks. You have it right there. And down here, number three, it says, after you get saved and things, it says, number three, be baptized, worship, fellowship, and serve with Christians in a church where Christ is preached and the Bible is the final authority. So they're telling people to go find a church building an area. Now, you know, at one point in time, that might have been true. 
I'll grant you. You go back to the 1950s or 1960s, most church buildings were still preaching the gospel correctly. They were still singing the old hymns. They still had standards and whatever. I've never been for, you know, I, I, I'll say it this way. Uh, I was at one point in time for church buildings because I hadn't heard the arguments against them. But, you know, the Bible, again, there are no church buildings in Scripture. Uh, there's many problems with that. I've done plenty of studies on that if you want to see more. But, uh, you know, I will freely confess that at one point in time, there would have been these church buildings and things like that. There were people who were, had better standards, at least, than they do today. They'd never been right. God never told anybody to build a church building and invite saved and lost into it. Uh, that's far into Scripture. But there would have been a point in time when they would have been closer to the truth. So that might have been close to the truth way back when, but it's not anymore. Find a good Bible-believing church where, you know, the Bible's the final authority. <laughs> not going to happen. You know, I mean, I've, I've heard horror stories from brethren out there. I mean, just weird, weird stuff that people are experiencing in independent fundamental Baptist churches. And, you know, and you say, well, you're picking on the Baptists. Uh, they're the only ones left that are even close to being true. Okay, I'm not, I, don't, I don't even waste time talking about Methodist churches or Lutherans or Presbyterians or whatever else. They're just like, if you're going there, you got major problems. <laughs> okay, really big problems. I pick on the Baptists because they're one of the few that actually have some people that still have some sense. And uh, not much, though. So, where does Satan currently dwell? If he's not seating, sitting on a throne, he actually does sit on a throne. We're going to see where that's at today in Scripture, according to the Bible. But uh, where does he currently dwell? Isaiah chapter 14. Let's look about this. I figured this would be a good one, you know, because of Halloween coming up here soon, and they, you know, people don't openly glorify Satan. Um, well, some do, but, uh, you know, it's kind of his favorite holiday, I believe. So I'm going to use this opportunity to kick the devil. Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 15. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. He shall be brought down to hell. Not, well, I know that you live in hell and you got that nice throne down there and all the demons come and circle it and stuff. No, no. This is a future thing that's going to happen. Hmm. Ezekiel 28. Turn more towards your New Testament. Ezekiel 28. If you're newly saved, you don't know where Ezekiel's at. Ezekiel 28, verses 11 through 12. It says here, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God, every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets, and of thy pipes was repaired in thee in the day that thou wast created. Um, very interesting thing there. He's called the king of Tyrus. And I've heard people try to do commentary on this, and they'll say, well, it's obviously talking about an actual physical king in Tyrus. Okay, how is a physical king? Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Oh, uh, no. Whatever king of Tyrus that was around in Ezekiel's day, you know, as far as like a king actually in that area, um, he wasn't, he couldn't be said of him that he's in Eden. Okay, in the Garden of Eden. I mean, the only characters that were in the Garden of Eden was God, Adam, Eve, and eventually the devil in Genesis chapter 3. So who's it talking about here? Hmm, the devil. Called the king of Tyrus. Uh, what do kings sit on? Thrones. 
Did the king sit on a throne in hell? No. He sat on a throne on the earth. How about that? Luke chapter 4. Turn to, turn to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verse 5. Actually, we'll start at verse 4. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, thou sh That man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. You saw the last study on the thing of milk versus meat. Um, I talked about bread, the Bible being likened to bread compared to bread. There's the verse. Okay, verse 5, Luke chapter 4, verse 5. And the devil taking him up into an high mountain showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Notice Jesus didn't say, hey, that isn't true. You don't have power over the political kingdoms. That's not true at all. He just simply said, you worship God. Jesus is God. You see? That's all that went on there. But now think about this. How do you climb to the top of the political power structure? Oh, that would be by uh, worshiping Satan. That's why when you study the thing, if you have never heard of the Illuminati or you know, the Bohemian Grove or the Council on Foreign Relations or the Trilateral Commission or the Bilderbergers or any of these other political power structures, the Freemasons, the Jesuits, the, any of this stuff, these secret societies, um, if you've never heard about it and you look into it, you're going to discover these people are Satan worshipers. Now, their ideas of their, so a lot of times Satan is kind of philosophical to them or whatever else. But uh, it all goes back to them actually worshiping Lucifer in some form or shape or, or whatever. That's what these guys do. Turn next to Ephesians chapter 6. So if you want political power, you're going to have to worship the devil and be subservient to him. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. It says here, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You mean the king of Tyrus is not actually a flesh and blood type of a king? It's actually Satan? You know, in other words, it's not, I should say he might have been flesh and blood, but it was the devil in him. And that's what I believe. You know, the Bible talks about Satan entering into Judas Iscariot. Uh, I think that a lot of these world rulers and leaders and things like that, I think that the devil can possess them, you know and take over their body. I think that the Antichrist is going to be the ultimate example of that. But check this out, Ephesians 6, verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in hell on a throne. Oh, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. It's a spiritual wickedness in high places. Why on earth are people believing that Satan is on a throne seated in hell? Kind of weird. Go back to Ezekiel chapter 28. Back to the Old Testament there, to the book of Ezekiel where we were earlier. Ezekiel 28, verse 13. <clears throat> says here, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Obviously, talking about Satan. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Kind of an interesting thing. Let's see if I have the book here. Uh, scanning for my book. Um can't see it right now. It's around here someplace. But kind of an interesting thing. I have the book on the Vatican. But I find it interesting.
that uh, there's no mention of Jesus Christ ever wearing any kind of precious stones or gold or anything else when he was here on this earth. And yet his, uh, you know, Christ's representative, the Pope, the Vicar of Christ, uh, he adorns himself in all kinds of fancy gold and all these gemstones and everything else. Hmm. Satan, as an anointed cherub here, we're going to read that in the next verse, verse 14. Satan is there and he's got all these precious stones and gold and everything else on. And he sits on the throne and rules over people like the uh, Pope does. Strange, isn't it? Verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. Hmm. God created him to be perfect. But he sinned. He messed up very badly. <clears throat> look at verse 16. <clears throat> By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries, by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic, therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all men that behold thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. Many, many, many prophecies there about the devil, and specifically their last 18 and 19 there is talking about at the end of the millennial kingdom. He's put into the bottomless pit, Revelation 20, early on there. At the end, he's loosed for a little season, goes out, deceives the people. We're going to probably be reading this. Yep. Uh, again, I'm looking at old, these are old sermon notes here. I'm preaching uh, audio when that was originally recorded years ago, and now it's going to be a video. So, But um, the devil gets bound and put in prison, and he comes out, deceives the nations, and gathers them to battle against Jerusalem and fire comes down from heaven and, and devours them. So that's what you're seeing here, this prophecy in Ezekiel 28. Again, it's not about some king or something like this that lived in Ezekiel's day. All right, this is talking about Satan, the anointed cherub here. That's what it's talking about. He was in Eden and he's going to be the whole way at the end of the millennial kingdom. So it's not just some, you know, man that was you know, around there. But uh, <clears throat> let's look at Revelation 2. Just find it interesting that uh, the Pope lines up with so much of that. Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. This is an interesting one. Revelation 2, verse 12. And to the angel of the, per of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with, the two, with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. Hmm. Satan dwells on the earth. He's got a seat. Sits on a throne. How about that? You mean to tell me he's not in hell down there? Have you seen it? Well, Brother Brian, you know, if, if we but if we can, you know, illustrate our comics that way or illustrate our tracks that way and if we can do it that way and somebody gets saved as a result, they're getting saved by a lie, brethren. Oh, well, yeah, it's not really a lie. It's artistic interpretation. No, it's a lie. 
Does the Bible teach that Satan is sitting on a throne in hell? No. Then what are you doing drawing it that way? Or what are you doing perpetuating that false teaching? It's not there. Revelation 13. Go to Revelation 13, verses 1 through 4. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wor wondered after the beast, and they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with him? Hmm. So uh, it isn't just, well, you know, back there in the first century, you know, the church of Pergamus, you know, and, and uh, you know, they knew where Satan dwelled and even where his seat was and things. And uh, yeah, that was around the first century, but not anymore. Uh, no, there's a future fulfillment there. The devil gives him his seat. And by the way, it says, uh, he gave him his power and his seat. So don't say, well, the seat means just like the seat of government, the power of the government and things there. No, because it says power and seat and great authority. So you can't really have great authority over people until you're the guy sitting up there in the chair. And isn't it interesting that all political power structures will follow that exact same thing? They'll all have their throne. They'll all have their official guy sitting up there. Hmm. But only one political ruler, and I do mean political ruler in this world, only one will sit there wearing gold and precious stones. I'll just let you figure out who I mean there. Because I'm sure you have no clue, you know. <laughs> Turn to Job. Back to the book of Job. Back in the Old Testament. Job chapter 1. Verses 6 through 7. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Hmm. It's Job 2, 1 through 2. Again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. <laughs> you, know, you can tell he's like saying the same thing. You know, I mean, he realizes God, you know, the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. God knows exactly what he's doing. You say, well, then why would God ask him where he'd been, essentially? Um, because Satan has to report for duty. He said, well, what did you say? I said, Satan has to report for duty before God Almighty. Satan doesn't run how God does. You see? You see, I, you know, you see these pictures, it cracks me up. You, see, you know, Jesus is like, you know, he's like this, you know. He's arm wrestling, then you got the devil, and he's, you know, he's arm wrestling the, the Lord. Stupid. You know, God up in heaven on his throne, and the devil's down in his throne, you know, and the flames coming up. You know, that's not the devil. That's not the devil at all. And you read your Bible, the timing of Revelation there. Christians go up in Revelation chapter 4. You know, again, I've talked about that in other studies. Body of Christ is up there. Revelation chapter 5, 24 elders, great multitude of angels were there. It isn't until many chapters later that the devil gets kicked out of heaven. Hmm, Revelation chapter 12. So when we get there, the devil's going to be there. 
How about that? He's not down in hell on a throne. Quit drawing him that way. He has to report before God. And by the way, if you're some kind of Satanist or something like that, that thinks that you want to worship the devil and, and whatever else, uh, you're worshiping somebody that's subservient to Almighty God. Kind of funny, actually. Revelation chapter 12. We're going to go there actually right now. We're going to see when the devil gets kicked out of heaven. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the dragon was cast, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. No confusion over who this is. Which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Okay, now you say, well, I thought he was on the earth. I thought his throne was on the earth and everything else. Sure, but he, you see, he goes between the two. The Lord says, hey, Satan, from whence comest thou? From going to and fro on the earth and walking up and down in it. You see? So he has to, he's down here on the earth, over at the Vatican and things like this is where I believe his throne is. And he's here on the earth. And, you know, he's called the King of Tyrus at one point in time. So I don't think it's any stretch of the imagination at all, you know, that he gets called up to, you know, heaven and has to go up there and report for duty, you know. And he walks in, you know, they walk in before the Lord, the, all the sons of God there, the angels in the book of Job, chapters 1 and 2, you read about that. They're there, all these angels, and they're reporting before the Lord, you know, reporting for duty. And the Lord says, you know, Satan, from whence comest thou? You know, steps forward, you know, I don't know if he salutes or not, but, uh, you know, reports for duty. But you see, in the time of Jacob's trouble, nope, there's no more place found for them. Get down there to the earth and you stay down there. Very interesting. Verse 10, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. <laughs> you know, I'm post-trib. Well, then you don't read much Bible. There are people that are dwelling there. You know, the brethren there. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. He still doesn't go down to hell, though. doesn't say, well, he heads down to hell to his headquarters down there and things like that. No, he hasn't been there yet. Revelation chapter 20. Turn there. I have a few points written out here real quick. I'll read these. Point number one about what we read in Revelation 12. Um, he's still there now. He's not ruling in hell. Very true. Number two, Satan will be there when we are caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble. Yep, absolutely. Now, I can't prove this. Number three, point number three I have here. I can't prove this, but maybe the Lord will force Satan to witness, uh, be a witness there at the judgment seat of Christ. You know, accuser of our brethren. You know, and so your, your works are tried there in the fire. What you've done for your flesh, wood, hay, stubble, you know, that gets burned up. What you've done for the Lord, gold, silver, precious stones... Uh, again, I'm going to be doing a study on that. I did a big two-part study on the judgment seat of Christ. We'll be getting, we'll be doing a video on that in the future. But those things that you've done for the Lord, they make it through the fire, and those are your rewards. So maybe the, the devil's going to be there, kind of as the uh, prosecuting attorney. I don't know. Interesting theory. Number four, Satan had to behave before, because he will be, he was required to report to God. But number five here, my fifth point on Revelation chapter 12, in the last part of the time of Jacob's trouble, Satan is no longer going to need to report. That's a sobering thought, isn't it? Again, the body of Christ is down there on the earth and the Lord's just kicking Satan down and somebody's up in heaven, you know, saying, hey, the accuser of the brethren is cast down. 
the brethren aren't in heaven, but they're the people that are in heaven. Them that are in heaven are cheering because the accuser of the brethren is cast down. Post-tribism is stupid beyond belief. But the Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 3, says here, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. That's going to be fun to watch, you know. Here's the devil, and he's slinking around you. He's trying to get out of there. And I believe in context, you know, you read about the, the marriage that happens down on the earth. And, uh, you know, this stranger comes in, and, and he doesn't have on a wedding garment. And the Lord's like, bind him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness. I believe that that's the devil. He tries to come into the marriage supper, you know, the wedding reception, essentially. And the Lord's like, get him, bring him here. Down you go. It's going to be pretty good. Look at verse uh, 7 through 10 in Revelation 20. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to, to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and, th and the beloved city, Jerusalem, and you can read about that in Matthew chapter 5, the city of the great king. Jerusalem is the city of the great king. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Absolutely justified. Can't wait to see that happen. But you see, this is the first mention of the devil being cast into hell. The very first time. He's not on a throne in hell, brethren. That's a lie. It's not true. And when he gets cast into hell, he's going to be just like anybody else down there. No more important, you know. Nobody's going to be down there, you know, weeping and wailing, gnashing of teeth. I think it's going to be, you know, called the lake of fire in, in eternity there. And, you know, I think it's going to be like they're kind of swimming, trying to like you're perpetually drowning, you know, trying to keep your head above this, you know, surface and it's just flames and burning it's you know horrifying just absolutely horrifying but then you understand sin and you understand how wicked people are and how wicked things are uh, God's justified and sending people that reject his son go to hell and burn the way people are and things like this um, it's bad but it's not going to be like anybody's going to be down there and they'll be, you know, just screaming and weeping and wailing. And all of a sudden the devil bumps into them and they go, oh, I can't believe it's you. Oh, the devil. I can't, man, I, you know, it's an honor to meet you, sir. You're really something. You know, you lived thousands of years and you deceived all them people and everything. He's just going to be another cursed, wicked, you know, devil down there. So... Verse 11 through 15, Revelation 20. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Great white throne. So the one that sits on the throne last is the Lord. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Who sits on the throne last? The Lord. Is there any mention at all of even when the devil gets cast into the lake of fire, does he get a throne down there? Nope. No, he does not. Turn to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25, verse 41. So the judgment of the nations here. 
Then shall he all, say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell was created for Satan. And you understand how wicked this world is and how the horrible, horrible things that have happened in this world. And understand that Satan is the one who's behind the whole thing. Yeah, eternal burning, eternal torment is a very just punishment for the devil. Anybody rejects this sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, they're going to go there too. Just as simple as that. So who really controls hell? Turn to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Who's that talking about? God. God controls hell, not Satan. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 29 through 30. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not uh, that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Hell's a pretty serious place. And yet, how many people even think about it? How many people even just, they don't even care. They'll use hell as a dirty cuss word, or they'll joke about hell. They, they laugh about it and things. Pretty bad. And I have here, you know, uh, uh, what about this thing of the hand, cut your hand off, your foot and your eye? What do you have there? Well, you have your hand, that's what you touch things that you reach for, that God's Word condemns. Your foot, where do you walk? Where do you go? What are the places that you like to be? The Bible says men love darkness rather than light. What about the eye? What you look at, the things that you covet after, the things that you lust after. The Bible talks about the lust of the eyes. Yeah. Those are the things that are going to keep people from getting saved. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, first part of it says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. One of your strongest motivations as a Christian, brethren, is understanding that hell is real. And it's a place of eternal torment. You've got to keep that thing in mind. God's the one who controls it. It's not the devil. It's not some, you know, somebody, all these people and stuff. Oh, hell's going to be such a cool party and everything else. It's a horrible place. It's a frightening place. It's a great motiva motivating a f uh, factor, you know, when you get a little bit scared of handing out a tract or putting a tract someplace or whatever else. Remember that that thing, that gospel tract, could turn somebody away from hell. could turn them to Jesus Christ. Just make sure that your gospel tracts don't have pictures of winged angels or Satan on a throne in hell. Make sure that you have a powerful gospel tract. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 through 31. It says here, For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall, be, shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace? For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again the Lord shall judge his 
people. Who's the book written to? Hebrews. It's talking about Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. But again, you have this thing, it'll cross dispensational lines. You'll see that. This is true for you know, pretty much anybody. Verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. I saw somebody in the comments here today and earlier on, and they were like, you know, you don't understand the love of God. You need to understand the love of God more, God's love and everything else. God is love. Sure, that's what the Bible teaches. Um, but it's also a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. God is also wrath and hatred on a level that we can't fathom. You know why? Because you can't know everything about people. You can walk out there and you can see some sweet old lady out there and she's just walking along and oh, she's so sweet and, and she just smiles and oh, hello. And you say, can I help you with your groceries? Oh, thank you. And everything else. She could be the most wicked, depraved, been involved in satanic ritual abuse, just horrible, horrible, depraved person, and you'll never know it. But God knows. God knows everything about everybody. He'll judge your secrets. He'll judge your thoughts. He's seen everything that you've ever done. So, oh, God, you know, a loving God would never condemn people to hell. I think you'd change your mind if you knew what people were actually doing and thinking something. Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2 verses 4 through 9. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell. God cast them down to hell. And delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. Hmm. I find that kind of interesting. I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, verse 7. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. God controls hell. And he sends people down there that are wicked. I find it very interesting, all these fires out there in California right now, I think they've got most of them contained. The real bad ones have just swept through this neighborhood and just, just torching everything. People are like saying, you know, I see videos of people driving through when it was burning and stuff and it's just like just flames everywhere and smoke and people were gagging and coughing and, and they're like barely had time to get out. Uh, that's nothing compared to hell. You better get saved. Better think about that. Revelation 14. Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 11. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. You tie that in with the book of Hebrews. The Hebrews there in the time of Jacob's trouble, there's... You know, they don't have eternal security like we do today. They're not sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. If they make a profession of faith and then later on get messed up, worship the beast and take the mark, worship the beast and his image and take the mark, say it that way, they go to hell and they burn forever and ever and ever. It's going to be a terrible, terrible, terrible time, you know, to be alive in that time there. So... I think we can clearly see um, this teaching, uh, this this drawing of the devil sitting on some kind of throne and the flames and all this other stuff and he's ruling hell and God rules heaven, it's unscriptural. And uh, brethren, we can't twist the scriptures 
and or I should and shouldn't say necessarily twist the scriptures. We can't put out information that's not firmly grounded in, on the scriptures and expect God to bless it. Uh, that's why I find, uh, you know, I've been sent a lot of tracks. I've bought a lot of different gospel tracks over the years and things. And, you know, I'll show these once again. I did a whole video on the thing of different types of tracks. And, uh, you know, um, you know, the, uh, these are two here put out by Time for Truth over in the UK. And they have their address and things on the back. You know, coasters, if you go to a restaurant or something, you could put this down like on the table or whatever else. And, um, you know, and it's got on the back, you know, right there you have scripture. Uh, verse of scripture, right there. Some words, you know, kind of getting people thinking there and stuff like this. And down here, contact information for the ministry down around there. There you go. Again. Yeah, the whole thing right there. Scripture, 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 Scripture. All the Word of God. And you get, uh, you know, Fellowship Track League. Right there. And uh, again, a lot of, uh, do it this way so you can see it better. Um, some words and stuff in there, but but you have scriptures throughout the thing. Quotations of scripture. And, you know, some of the chick tracks are okay. I mean, we've been going through some of the chick tracks and they're, they're not all, you know, bad or, or whatever. Uh, there's some that, that don't really show any kind of a winged, you know, angel or or whatever. Uh, they don't show Satan on a, on a throne and things. I mean... It, but there's the ones that do, and it's just distressing. And I'm just like going, you know, and even if you get through this one here, I mean, this one, the almost time one, just quickly looking through it, I didn't see any kind of winged angels and things uh, or Satan on a throne in hell. But, you know, it still tells people to go find a good church in their area, you know, fellowship in a good church. Um, you know, uh, I get put in these positions so many times. It's just like, you know, and, and we all struggle with it. It's not just uniquely me, but it's just, you know, you see things and it's like, it's not what the Bible teaches. What are we supposed to do with this? Well, I'm not going to mess with it. Uh, does that mean I'm withdrawing any support from Chick Publications? No, it doesn't mean that. It just simply means I'm just, if it's got winged angels, if it's got Satan on a throne in hell, those things are unscriptural. They're clearly unscriptural. This isn't even just minor doctrinal stuff that we can agree to disagree or whatever. They're unscriptural. It's wrong. And, you know, you put that kind of stuff out, it's not going to have the power of God's Word behind it. So, uh, that's going to be it for this study. Um, you know, if, if you're... I mean, you know, anybody that's worshiping the devil, I mean, maybe unless you skip forward to the end here or whatever, but most people that worship the devil aren't going to watch the whole thing. But uh, if you're worshiping the devil, you're worshiping a loser. He's not ruling anything, okay, as far as, you know, uh, hell or something like this. It's not his region or realm or whatever. That's a lie. Uh, and I find it really sad that it's being perpetuated by professing Christians. It's just, it's like... So uh, that's going to be it for this study. And I'm uh, going to keep doing some of these interspersed with some other videos that we'll be bringing out. But uh, please do keep us in your prayers. Again, you know, if you could pray for my wife's uh, unspoken prayer requests, I would surely appreciate that. Um, let's, let's hold each other up in prayer. Well, that's an important thing. So that is going to be it, and we will see you in the next study.